Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Biro. I'm festival director. You are here at the last of the talks and masterclasses we had at the festival. I hope you'll agree we saved the best for last. Just a quick show of hands. How many of you were there at the live to screen crash performance last night? Oh, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. For those who weren't there, it was awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome to the stage three-time Oscar winner, four-time Grammy winner, three-time Golden Globe winner, moderated by Kaleem, Mr. Howard Shore. Good afternoon. Uh, before Barrow runs off, I'd just like to say it's his almost last day as festival head. And so I'd like us to show our appreciation of Barrow and the work he's done over here. Okay, now on to Mr. Shaw. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you, and uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for coming today. Uh, I kind of like to start at the beginning, which is, um, what was your childhood like? Where was it? <laughs> Where did you grow up? How did you get into music? Uh, I grew up in Toronto, and uh, I played in... Uh, I sang in the choir, actually, in... Uh, what you would call secondary school. And then in Canada, they did a test called the Seashore Test. It was an electronic computer graphite pencil test. They gave it to every student in the country in 1954. I was about eight years old. And they were looking for uh, music uh, students that had good, good hearing and uh, would be good musicians. And if you scored high on this test, they offered you an instrument, and um, I was offered uh, the violin. I didn't want to. I was eight years old. I didn't want to play the violin, and then they offered, I think, the flute. And I thought, no, no, maybe not the flute. And then uh, the clarinet. My mother rented a clarinet for me. Uh, it came in a shoebox with tissue paper, and so I. They immediately put me in the orchestra. I was playing Elgar's Pomp and Circumstance at eight with a clarinet. I knew about three notes. But that's how I started, and then I prog progressed uh, into saxophones, and uh, I did eventually play the flute as well. But that Canadian test actually started me in music. Uh, what did your parents think? Were they excited about this musical pursuit? Uh, yeah, they were supportive. The, uh, I had a teacher uh, when I was young named, uh, he was my clarinet teacher, named Morris Weinswag. And his brother, John Weinswag, you can look this up if you'd like, was the dean of uh, contemporary classical music in Canada. Uh, and uh, I think so his brother, who was teaching the young student, thought that it would be good to... Uh, teach him a counterpoint in harmony. It went with the clarinet lesson. So every week I did these exercises in these primers of harmony and counterpoint in pencil, and that got me writing. And so over the years, I played a lot of instruments, but I kept the pencil moving. And uh, that's how the composition really started. And what was the music that you were listening to at the time? I'm not... So sure, I know what was happening in Toronto in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, well, I was, th this is the 50s. I'm back in the 50s, yeah, and I'm, my parents had a good jazz collection. And uh, more, more sort of 40s swing music and things like that, like Benny Goodman. So I, I, I thought the clarinet was kind of cool at eight years old because of uh, Benny Goodman kind of mu music, swing music. And... Um, and then I was listening to a lot of rock, you know, in those early years. I eventually did join a rock group called Lighthouse uh, in, in Toronto. 
Uh, after high school, I went to college in uh, Boston to study composition at Berkeley uh, School of Music, and I studied with a very good uh, choral composer named uh, John Bavicki, and I think he got me uh, listening to uh, singing and choral music quite early, um, which I think went, a lot of that went into Lord of the Rings, all of that love for the voice and the choir, children's choir. Uh, so that was early, early influences. The, the rock uh, influences went into a band uh, called Lighthouse, and that took me really around the world in touring. I did a thousand one-nighters in four years. We'd play 250 concerts a year. And uh, I was quite young. I was just out of, out of college. And uh, I, you know, I got a lot of that traveling out of my system very early on. We opened for Jimi Hendrix at the Isle of Wight. And we toured with Grateful Dead and uh, a Big Brother and the Holding Company, Janis Joplin, Jefferson Airplane. Yeah. So no one big then. Sorry, <laughs> I was, sorry. No one big. <laughs> yeah. Um, for you, had, what was that moment before where you decided that music would be something you tried to pursue professionally? And was uh, that hard to do? Well, I was with a group of... Uh, my background is in repertory theatre. I had a group of friends that became directors and writers and actors, all of which I did uh, when I was a teenager. And uh, it seemed that I, I was interested in all these theater arts. Uh, I wasn't really exceptional academically, so I kind of leaned to music. My brother, older brother kind of directed me towards Berkeley because he knew of it and had a friend who went there successfully. So I applied. And once I was at Berkeley, the whole world opened up. I mean, they basically showed you where all the knowledge was, which was really the, the library and where the scores were. And I mean, I'm older now, but I've been studying music since I was that kid. It's a constant, uh, you know, interest in something that I love. And uh, it, it kind of goes on every day. I compose almost every day, and I'm listening to things and thinking about music all the time. I'm, things I'm hearing and how they're created is going on r regularly. And then you're talking about composition, but with The Lighthouse, you're on stage as well. Where does the one turn into the other? Where do you go from yeah. being on stage to well, being Well, the composed? composition went on for quite a while. Um, it, it's always, you know, gone on. But I mean, in those early years, even though I was playing, I was writing all the time for an, any group that I could write for, uh, little brass trios, quartets, things like that. In Lighthouse, I got to write for the group. It was kind of like a rock orchestra. It was the period of Procol Harum and Knights in White Satin, Moody Blues, you know, where orchestras were playing... Uh, our rock groups were playing with orchestras, so we did. We wrote a ballet in Canada called Ballet High in the '60s, and uh, we toured with the Winnipeg Ballet, and we played with all of the uh, orchestras from Vancouver uh, through Montreal to the e east coast of Canada. All the orchestras uh, played with us as a rock group. And so I was writing for orchestra and conducting quite young, maybe 20, 21 kind of age. And then you, I believe you got a job in television. How did that come about? Uh, well, CBC, Canadian Broadcasting, which is like the BBC in Canada, was very uh, generous uh, with young artists. And they had uh, radio stations and television stations, and they were trying to fill it with Canadian programming. So they welcomed anybody who was uh, capable of uh, producing shows or writing music. I basically walked into CBC uh, kind of unknown uh, when I was maybe about 18, 17 or 18, and they gave me an office that was like a broom closet. It had a big old Victorian piano in it and a coat rack. And I would go there and write. And they put me to work writing uh, radio uh, shows. I did comedies and dramas uh, for radio. And um, 
and then I progressed to television. All the while, I was also writing small documentaries and uh, like nature films and things like that with small groups. And then the radio uh, CBC, we uh, with Lauren Michaels, we did television um, and early shows that we did progressed into the show Saturday Night Live in uh, New York. Yeah, Lauren Michaels took you to New York, is that right, in the mid-70s? Well, we had worked together. I had known Lauren. Uh, I met Lauren at summer camp in northern Ontario when I was 13. And we did shows in summer camp. And we did a show, kind of a variety show, that was very similar to uh, Saturday Night Live, uh, where we would do sketches and comedy routines. And we were basically uh, 14, 15, 16 years old. And it was a way to perform in da at dances, socials that they had with the girls' camp. And it was a way to meet girls, really. So we, uh, we did these, you know, kind of funny shows. And then we also did uh, plays. We did the Fantastic, and we did musicals like Bye Bye Birdie and uh, uh, West Side Story and things like that. Lauren directed me. I sometimes directed him. And then when we... You know, we're continuing to grow up in Toronto. Then the, both of us worked for radio uh, and, and CBC television. We did a version of Saturday Night Live in Toronto called the Lorne and Hart Fantastic Hour, or Terrific Hour, actually. And uh, we did that for maybe three or four years. And then Lorne went to L.A. I went on the road with this rock group, Lighthouse. And then four years later, we met in... in uh, uh, New York, 1975, and there was maybe three people that were at the beginning where we started Saturday Night Live at NBC. And then it went on to be possibly the most iconic show, especially those early years, right. uh, the 70s and 80s. 40, 45, I think yeah. now. 45 years now. 45 years, yeah. What was it like at the beginning? Well, I thought the show would... I came from Toronto to New York to do the show. I thought it would last three months. And I kept my flat in Toronto for a few years, figuring I'd always go back. But then it was very successful. Uh, after about a year, it became successful. People were watching. And uh, we really had no idea of the, really the success of it. We were in... Uh, offices in the 17th floor of Rockefeller Center. Nobody was paying any attention to us. And uh, that time slot for television, uh, 11.30 on Saturday night, was always gun smoke reruns. And it was television that nobody was really paying much attention to. So NBC allowed us to do pretty much everything we wanted to do. And it was innovative at the time. I mean, became very successful. You were on it, you were in it. How do you make music for a sketch show? Uh, well, I did, a, we did a little of everything. I mean, in, the, in those early years of the show, it wasn't so organized as it, it, as it appears to be now. And uh, we did, uh, you know, each Monday, uh, the writers and the creators of the show and actually, it wasn't so defined into performers, writers. Everybody did a little of everything. There was maybe 12 or 14 of us would sit in a room and we'd go, it's Monday. We have to put on a 90-minute live television show on Saturday. What, what are we going to do? Can you dance? Can you sing? Can you tell a joke? Like, <laughs> you know, can we write something for you? So everybody kind of chipped in to do anything. Uh, to put on this show, and it was very egalitarian in, in the beginning, where everybody did a little of everything. And then it became more of a design, you know, the program took shape, and the, the show that you see now evolved after maybe about two years in the beginning. And one last question about that, which I've been dying to ask, is I read, is this true, that you came up with the Blues Brothers name? Uh, it's true. I used to do a warm-up to the show, which was bringing the audience in, and uh, comedians would sometimes do it. But the b band, I was a music director of the show, 
And the band was steeped in the music of Stax Volt. I love Junior Walker and Otis Redding. And uh, the band was playing uh, all these blues pieces. Some were original pieces that I was writing. And some of them were, you know, standards, standard pieces. Um, and so Dan Aykroyd, who I knew actually from Toronto, he played a little harmonica, and he wanted to play blues harp with us on some of these blues tunes uh, that we played. And of course, John Belushi wanted to get in on it. And then I would used to introduce them as those brothers in blues, the Blues Brothers and they would come up and play with the band at the beginning of the show. And, and then we did a couple of pieces on the show, King Bee and a couple other things, and it kind of evolved from there. This is a kind of a mid-period Cronenberg mm. film. I liked, I wanted to show the clip first because it's the beginning of a film and I wanted to talk about your beginnings. Right. So how did you meet Cronenberg? Uh, he was a, a, a kid in the neighborhood, actually, where I grew up. We both grew up in Toronto. He's a few You years, lived in a good neighborhood. It, it was a very hip neighborhood, I guess. What was in the water? Yeah. Uh, and David, uh, he had a beautiful motorcycle and beautiful motorcycle jacket and clothes and helmet. And he, and, uh, he was very striking. And he, when I was 14, he was 17. And that's a big difference because he had his license, he could drive. <laughs> and I, you would see him driving in the neighborhood. You go, who's that? Who's that kid? You know, and you found out that he made films. Uh, David made 8 millimeter films and then 16 millimeter and then it progressed into 24 frames and, uh, and, and making feature films. So he made these short films, which I saw as a youngster at underground film festivals on the weekend. I mean, when I was 17 and 18, we would go to these Friday night late uh, cinema screenings with Kenneth Anger films and Cronenberg. And so I, I knew his work and um, I didn't approach him to do a film until he made The Brood, and I was in my I was in my 20s, and I had done one film before The Brood. That was the first film I did with him. And uh, he said, he took me on, and he, he knew my work from this one film that I had done. And he was generous, and I did The Brood, and then we started our collaboration. And so you were friends, and you were scared to approach him? Or? No, I didn't really know him. I knew, he was like a few years older than me, so you know, as a, kid you don't really make friends that so yeah. carefully with you know you're mostly in your own age group uh, but I knew people who did know him and uh, I knew I knew for instance I did know K Carolyn who is his wife and um, I was good friends with her, her brother who was uh, her brother Stephen uh, Seifman so uh, you know, it was a close-knit kind of community in Toronto, so I didn't know him. And then um, you approach him about The Brood. How do you work together? Do you, does he make the film and then show you? How does that work? He always sends me, he, he'll call me with the script. He'll say, I have a script, and he'll send me the script. And uh, then we discuss, quite often we discuss things like casting. Oh, wow. You know, who he was thinking of uh, having be in the film and um, I would quite often visit the set I'd usually make at least one set visit for every production and uh, I'd wait till he had a cut of the film and uh, the way I write compositionally is as soon as I know I'm on a, a project I start to collect ideas and I put them in a folder and I I use the pieces of the compositional ideas from the folder to score the film. So as soon as I started the script or the reading the novel, in the case of Crash, it was based on the J.G. Ballard novel, I'm already putting my compositional ideas in the folder. And what do you get from visiting the set? Oh, just atmosphere. I actually, I mean, I don't really like to look behind the curtain that much. Uh, Thelma Schoonmacher, the great editor who works with Scorsese, she doesn't won't go to the set because she just wants to see what was shot. She doesn't want to see the workings, the trappings behind uh, the shot. 
And I guess I'm somewhat like that too. You want to have a, uh, an emotional reaction to the film. You don't want to remember the camera moving there, the cables or the lights. So I usually go just as a, a visit to see David and just talk about the movie a little bit and see how he's doing. And when you're writing these ideas down in this folder, is it always words or do you put photographs in or do you put the titles of songs? No, I write with pencil and paper. I mentioned when I was young, I was taught to, to write that way, counterpoint and harmony. So uh, all the ideas are sketched out. Uh, I like the graphite and the paper kind of aspect of writing and uh, of writing music. And so this is for pre-computers, really. Uh, films like The Brood, Scanners, Videodrome, they were all analog and they used a lot of electronics and scanners and Videodrome. Videodrome used the first, that was the third Cronenberg film, so I've done 15 films with David. But Videodrome used a large uh, digital computer that was actually quite new and innovative called the Synclavier and it was developed at Dartmouth. Uh, it was a defense department project, actually. It, it had military uh, work put into it because it was used for uh, sonar in submarines for analyzing sa uh, sound, showing waveforms of sampling. We're all common with sampling now, but this is sort of the beginning of that idea. And that was used for video drum, but I always used orchestras. I used elements of orchestras. It was always par part of it, even though there was electronics being used. And how are the discussions with David? Is he quite hands-on? Does he discuss the music? Does he, or does he let you go off and compose and show him the piece? Yeah, he lets me. He lets me run wild a bit. I think <laughs> um, he's very generous creatively and he's like that with all of his collaborators cinematographer editing especially the actors he works great with actors and he hires great actors to work with and i think he lets them you know express their ideas i know with me he would let me you know create the score uh, i wouldn't really play him too much but i would sometimes just go into the studio and do the recordings and he would say great and we'd put everything in the film he'd maybe do a little teeny little bit of editing sometimes i'd mix with him in the dub but he was very generous and he didn't really uh, restrict me in any way like if you look at these films that i've done with him each one allowed me more creative freedom as they went they just kept progressing through the 15 films and how do you choose the musicians? Does he have ideas or again? Well, in the case of Naked Lunch, which we just saw the opening of, uh, Ornette Coleman, uh, his album, The Shape of Jazz to Come, which was a very revolutionary album, came out in the late 50s, almost the exact same time that Naked Lunch was published by William Burroughs, which was also an incredibly innovative uh, book. And... Uh, it was a natural thing. I knew Ornette from Saturday Night Live. A lot of times one thing leads to another. I actually booked Ornette Coleman and his group to perform on national TV on Saturday Night Live, which was highly unusual at the time because they don't really book that way. But uh, So I met Ornette, I knew him, and when I started thinking about uh, Naked Lunch, uh, I gave him a call. He was in Copenhagen. But I met him in London, and we started to work together. So each film that I've done, I try to be uh, do something that I haven't done before. And uh, Crash, which we played last night, uh, the films before it were more symphonic. The Fly was the first really symphonic score I did for Cronenberg. That was the fourth film. That was in '86. And the early ones, the Brood, Scanners, Videodrome, were done late 70s, early 80s. The Fly was completely, uh, completely symphonic, and that led to scores like Dead Ringers and M Butterfly. And then Crash, which was kind of a combination of electric, it's kind of an electroacoustic experiment, if you, if you will, with the six electric guitars and the three acoustic harps. Uh, that grew out of... Uh, the need to kind of return to the earlier techniques of the films, what Cronenberg would call guerrilla filmmaking. We had to reduce our budgets to, 
you know, in a way to make films like Crash. And if we talk about this title sequence, which is designed by um, Randall Balsmeyer and Everett, yes. um, I heard, I read that it took them some time. They sent a few ideas to uh, David before they agreed on going for this more abstract approach. When did you start working on the title sequence? And what is it? Yeah. What's the importance of the opening music? Yeah, I was I was really trying to express the idea of uh, of inner zone. It was um, which is we think is uh, Morocco, Tangier, and Morocco. So I was sh trying to show the exotic uh, nature and sort of the colonization of. Uh, of this fictional place. So I'm using this English orchestra, which is very uh, kind of uh, playing these kind of waltz type rhythms, this sort of very slow sort of sweeping uh, dance. And then I have the jazz saxophone, uh, which evoked uh, the world of, uh, of Naked Lunch to me. Uh, when I studied Burroughs' book, the only thing I found in reference to music was the term bebop cocaine. Mm -hmm. And uh, that didn't describe Ornette to me, but I knew Ornette and his period and, and Naked Lunch had a connection. So I brought them together. Is the opening music more important than other type of music in a film? Because we often hear right. the iconic moment. Well, it sets, it sets uh, you're setting the world that you're entering. I like the idea of uh, the, the entering the cinema, the lights go down, it becomes dark, and then at the end of the room, the, a bit of light appears, and uh, the music is bringing you into the world. So in this case, it's hopefully bringing you into the world. It's preparing you for the story. Uh, it's like an introduction to the world of Naked Lunch. Do you ever sneak into a cinema and watch the audience watching some of your music? <laughs> uh, not, not, uh, not that often, but I, I have done that in the past, sure. It can be quite fun, actually. <laughs> yeah. um, we some of the horror titles, you know, like uh, I think in Scanners, uh, I went into a screening in Times Square when it was showing, and that was quite fun. It was very, very loud reaction to the film. I'm sure it was, to Scanners. It was a very different film at the time to anything else going on. And in terms of, we're going to show the next scene, which is from Crash, which we had this awesome concert last night. And uh, Crash is a film where the characters have sexual fantasies revolving around car crashes, and in the film, they recreate the car crashes of famous deaths. Right, and this is the Jane Mansfield uh, recreation. It's called the Mansfield crash in the f film, and uh, yeah, that sets it up pretty good, I think. Uh, that's incredible work on um, that film entirely. I mean, the book is provocative, and the film is provocative and quite abstract, and you match that in the music. Um, was that the sense? Do you get the sense of the music from what you're reading in the script? Uh, th this piece actually came out of <clears throat> the composition for M. Butterfly, which was the film we did before Crash. And I, in that film, it was the first uh, time that I used two harps, these acoustic harps. And... Uh, I liked the compositional idea, the counterpoint of that. So actually, before I even started on Crash, I was writing a piece for three harps using a composition, a contrapuntal idea that I had for the three instruments. And really, I developed that uh, once Crash was made for Crash. So quite often, in my relationship with film, I was using music techniques that I was developing on my own and then applying them to the film. And is that where David is such a good partner to you because he trusts you to go with your instincts? Yes, yes. I was able to really 
I do a lot of experimentation, try a lot of different things in, in all in the 15 films I've done with David. The uh, idea of using music in films varied from film to film, and uh, he's quite innovative in that way, and he's willing to uh, use music in non-conventional ways. And one of the things he he never really wanted to do was explain anything that was being uh, had to do with the story. He always allowed the audience t to bring their own ideas to uh, to the film, and so music was you became used in more uh, innovative ways to provide to add depth to the story, to provide a subtext to scenes in the film. And how does the music work in combination with the dialogue? Because we hear often, and what's surprising in Cronenberg's is we hear the score and the dialogue work together. Uh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm used to working with dialogue and working with actors, so I'm, I'm composing based on their movements, their phrasing, uh, the way the scene is edited. Uh, the orchestration I'm using might have to do with the timbre of the uh, of the dialogue. It's a very subtle thing. Um, you can see it in, in a lot of the films that I've done. You know, the working with dialogue is a very important aspect of writing film, music for film. Uh, do the words have a beat to you when you listen to the words? Well, there's a rhythm and there's a timbre. There's pacing. Uh, Working with great actors is sometimes can be really uh, easier in a way for the composer. Uh, I, we did a film with uh, Jeremy Irons. We did a couple of films uh, with him, and uh, Dead Ringers particularly is really I think well done, and the music is used in very uh, unique ways with the dialogue. Uh now, just to throw it a little bit differently, is um, how do you like to work? Do you like the room to be in your office, or do you like to write in cafes? How do you do it? <laughs> um, no, I'm, pr I'm, I'm pretty disciplined. I, I write in a 19th century uh, world, essentially. I always start, because I'm starting with pencil and paper, most people think of film composers surrounded with by technology, but I... I write the big, always the composition in this 19th century world. And it's always pencil and paper. I do four to six line uh, sketches for whatever I'm writing for, whether it's chamber orchestra, electronics, whatever it is, full orchestra. And uh, then I orchestrate in 30 stave. Uh, and uh, that's usually done in ink. And once the pencil sketches are uh, finished. They used to just copy them in ink and I'd go to the recording session with the orchestration also in pencil. And um, I did a lot of films like that, like in the 90s, before the, inter before the internet was, was so useful. And then I think in 2000, I started uh, using the internet more uh, to work with, because I, I, at that point I was working with Peter Jackson in uh, New Zealand. He was 9,000 miles away. And a way to communicate, the internet became useful as a way to communicate. At first we thought we di were careful with the internet because we didn't want the film to be disclosed on the internet. And we were thinking of using couriers to go back and forth between New York and Wellington, New Zealand, it's two days. And we were gonna work that way, and I said, I don't think that's gonna work. But uh, we started with a 56K dial-up on, uh, <laughs> on um, Fellowship of the Ring. And then by the time we got to Return of the King, I was doing uh, conducting at Abbey Road in London, and Peter was hearing it live in New Zealand through the, what they called the fat pipe. And uh, so the, as the technology developed, I started using more of the, of the technology, but I always started compositionally 19th century and then went to the 20th and the 21st century in terms of technology. And so I have a studio that I work in that's 
that I would go to. It's a couple miles from the rut compositional stage, and I'd go to that studio. James Sizemore, Alan Frey are there. It's two people I've worked with for many years. And we could communicate from that studio to London, Berlin, Los Angeles, New Zealand. Um, and that the communication was the key to it, being able to work. Because I live in, I live in right in a forest in uh, New York. It's outside of New York. It's a very 19th century world. And what do you get from the forest? What is that an inspiration for you? Completely. Nature. And I think my connection to Tolkien was all through nature. Because Lord of the Rings is essentially a story about everything green and good uh, to preserve nature. And I have a great love of nature as well. I'm very inspired by it. And the house that uh, Elizabeth and I, my wife Elizabeth, who's here, live in is 1910. And as we were restoring the house, we were also restoring the, uh, those turn-of-the-century gardens at the time. And I, and I noticed after a few years that as the gardens improved and became more beautiful, the music improved as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. And do you like to have animals around? Is that oh, yes. <laughs> uh, border collies, very important. <laughs> so we've lived with... Uh, two generations of border collies for 25 years. Oh, wow. And then the dogs in the room when you're... Comp oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're part of our lives. Yeah, very much. Amazing. We started to talk a little bit about Lord of the Rings, which makes a very nice moment to introduce a clip from the film, which is from The Two Towers, the second film. Which one is this? I think it's where we're in the battle and we're coming up and we discover that a certain magician, Gandalf, is not right. actually dead. <laughs> right. Helps deep, I think, yeah. Peter Jackson called you up, said Lord of the Rings. How did that happen? <laughs> um, well, it was interesting. I, I mentioned this a, a few days ago because somebody had asked me about tent music. And when Peter... Uh, was editing the film, he was putting music into the film from different films. And the editors were doing that as well. And at one point, they had so much music in the film, and Peter, I think, asked who created a lot of this music. And it turned out that they had used a lot of my scores in this temp mix. And they had even used uh, a piece from Crash, Wow. Believe it or not, yeah. <laughs> the ending, the last scene in Crash, that string piece was was used in the film. And so he said, well, I'll ring him up. So he rang me. And just out of the blue, hello, this is Peter Jackson. There was no introduction or anything. And I didn't know who it was. And uh, he said, I'm making this film, Lord of the Rings, and uh, we think uh, we'd like to meet with you. And... Uh, I said, where are you? He said, I'm in New Zealand. I didn't know anything about the making of the film. I, didn't, I had read Tolkien when I was in the rock band, when I was in Lighthouse. And when we were touring, I was reading Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit in the 60s, as a lot of my friends were. Uh, but I had no idea they were making a film about it. And, uh, but it was intriguing. And so I went to New Zealand, uh, took the journey to, to there, and... Um, met John Howe and Alan Lee, the two great Tolkien illustrators, and uh, toured Weta Digital. And I saw the level of filmmaking uh, was so high. It was so beautiful what they were creating there. I saw some of the film. Uh, you wanted, you didn't want to say no. You wanted to be part of it. It was just too, too great an opportunity. So. I didn't really know what I was taking on, but I said, yes, I agree. Uh, I'd like to work on the film. And got back on the plane and after a few days and went back to New York. And then we started a long uh, collaboration that took uh, three years and nine months, almost four years of work to complete the three films. Because they were making the three films simultaneously. So did you have to sign up for all three films? Or? I did, yes. The idea was to make three films, yes, always. And uh, we all know with these blockbusters that some of the most iconic music 
in history. We love uh, everybody goes to see these films. Was there an added pressure for you on the theme to know that people were waiting for the soundtrack as well as the movie? Well, the, there was a lot of pressure in the beginning to make uh, great films. I mean, the books have been uh, read by people all over the world, and they're they're really beloved. And now we had the responsibility of making uh, a, a film that had honored that honored Tolkien and that was truthful and had heart. So it was a really big responsibility to do it right. And we all felt that. But that was kind of the fellowship of the creators. Like we all uh, felt this responsibility and everybody worked uh, together supporting everybody else. It was really about the love of the book, a love of Tolkien's work that, that created it. Um, it was a lot of hard work to do the first film, but we worked so well together. And because the first film was successful, it actually raised the bar. Now you had to do Two Towers and you had to do Return of the King. And those films were barely uh, created when we finished. So we had to do a lot of reshooting. Um, you know, they were created step by step, but I felt that each one kind of got better too in, in, uh, in the filmmaking and the storytelling and definitely with me and the music as well, you know. So Return of the King was really the culmination of the whole work. And how did you go about creating the theme? Were there different discussions you had with Peter than you would with David, for example? Uh, the... The idea, it was interesting because you mentioned David, because when I first started scoring uh, Fellowship of the Ring, we started in the Mines of Moria. And the very first piece I wrote was the Fellowship going into the Mines. And uh, I wrote a piece that was really uh, like a Cronenberg type of piece. And, you know, that was more abstract and wasn't really telling the story too much, because with Cronenberg, I would always paint around the edges of the frame. I would never paint directly on. I wasn't there to, to really explain to the audience. And I was using those techniques in this scene, and they, Peter was you know, completely not understanding what I was doing and why I would do that. So we had a big discussion about it, and it, it's, you know, it was he felt that his story that he had to tell over these three films was so complex. The book is uh, considered one of the most complex fantasy worlds ever created. And he felt the re responsibility of making these uh, films about it to have a lot of clarity. Clarity was not something with Cronenberg that we ever really discussed in a lot of detail. It was like the audience could bring their own ideas to the film, where with Lord of the Rings, you had to explain if maybe people hadn't read the book and they went to see the film, who were the Lothlorien and uh, elves or the Rivendell elves? What about the men of Gondor, the men of Rohan? What's the difference? So the music, uh, rightfully so, uh, became used in a Wagnerian way, where we were using, I was using themes and light motifs to explain these different worlds. And the compositional ideas of, say, Rivendell and Lothlorien are quite different. The orchestration varies. So when you follow through the story, you understand who these characters are, and especially objects like swords and things like that, that you related to different cultures. Uh, in the story, so it was important to be used in that way. And then once I got into that process, it became very interesting to me because I was could create so specifically uh, these worlds, and I was orchestrating the piece myself. So I was keeping a very close hand on everything that was going into it, every instrument that was being used was being uh, written down, you know, in these full uh, symphonic scores. Uh, and the palette of musicians that I had for the piece was 230. So at any, any session, I could have that many players uh, to record for the film. 
It was a 96-piece symphonic orchestra, the London Philharmonic. Always the same orchestra for every session. And uh, maybe about 10 s featured soloists from different parts of the world. Because we used, I used instruments from the east, west, north, and south. Tolkien points the compass in four directions in the story, so I'm using instruments from four points of the globe. And, uh, and then a, a mixed choir of about 60, 70 singers, the London Voices, a boys' choir, 40, 50 singers, and the soloists. So it was a massive project, and uh, uh, with, with great happy results. Really, it was everything I knew about music uh, went into those scores. It came my way at a time when I, uh, I was kind of in my late 50s, so I, I had, a, I had a, the experience for years of working with the London film, maybe 15 years of films, a lot of Cronenberg films too. So I had the energy and the experience to create a, a new piece like that. And did you enjoy the moments where the music cool styles clashed, clashed with each other? Where the two tribes would meet on film. Not sure. Let's see. Uh, where the um, when the music when the music merges with each. When you've had the different styles of music, and from a one late motif and the other late motif, and they clash with each other on the screen. How did you work with that? Oh, I, I don't know. I mean, they're all the themes and motifs are all interwoven in, in the piece. Uh, Doug Adams, he's a uh, Chicago-based journalist, he, he spent nine years writing a book based on the music called The Music of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And he came to my studio in New York uh, every summer. And I gave him access to the vault and he went in the, you know, and studied the scores. And he uh, created a beautiful book about it. I mean, I was keeping a notebook as I was writing, but he put all the pieces of it together and uh, he, even, he even showed me some connections that I had made <laughs> because I'm writing so, so much music. I didn't always stop to ponder and think about it. A lot of it was instinctual as I was writing, and I didn't always go back uh, thematically. I would just remember themes and motifs, and so that kind of helped to broaden the the themes, it would help to develop them. Themes that I wrote in four, 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 I might in two towers have written in three because I was just using my memory. Was it in three? What tempo did I use? <laughs> and so I was kind of constantly developing the themes and motifs as I was working. Uh, quite rightly, you were given the Academy Award for your work on the, the first and the third one. Um, was that something that's important to you, to win Oscars and win awards? Well, it was completely surprising. I wasn't really... Um, I had entered my work previous to... Because the composer has to enter his work for the Oscar. Uh, and so I had entered other scores over the years, like Ed Wood and, I don't know, other Cronenberg scores, but I was completely ignored. And, and I was thinking back on it, uh, that I was probably ignored for about maybe 15 years. Uh, so I didn't, you know, I, I submitted uh, Fellowship of the Ring, but I didn't think anybody would pay attention to it. But then it turned out the film was successful and people were interested in it. Uh, so I went to the Oscars with Elizabeth and not thinking I would win. So it was kind of startling. We were just happy to be in the room that you had seen on television all those years and <laughs> with all those other great filmmakers. It was just exciting to be in the theater. And then uh, to win is exceptional because you go up the stairs and then something happens which you've never seen is because you turn around and you face the audience like I am now. But you've never really had that view. So once you turn around, it's kind of terrifying <laughs> because you see the audience, the lights and everything, you know. But it was an exciting moment, I must say. And you also had the song with uh, Annie Lennox win, and Fran Walsh worked on it too. Right. Well, that came later. That was uh, there was Two Towers was uh, there was that that went uh, that was released, and then it was Return of the King, 
and that had actually had two nominations, one for the song and one for the score. And so that was uh, quite exciting. And it was interesting with the Annie Lennox uh, song, is she sang it in the broadcast, so it had to be produced. And so I took on the role of being the producer, and, and so, uh, which meant I had to be backstage of the Oscars. And of course, I mentioned this before, but it's like looking behind the curtain. The first time, you, it was all magic because you're just in the audience. Now you're backstage and you're seeing the wires and the ropes and the, the control room and everything. And it sort of takes the magic out of it, you know. <laughs> um, now I'm going to move on to another of your um, collaborations uh, that you had with um, Martin Scorsese, mm -hmm. who a few people might have heard of. Um, oh. It started... Way back, you had one film with him in the 80s, which I think was the first after several Cronenberg films, which was After Hours. Right. How did it start? How did your relationship with Scorsese start? Uh, Cronenberg actually introduced me to Scorsese, Scorsese, and we all had dinner together in New York. And uh, Marty was a big fan of Cronenberg's work. He knew it. And he actually called Cronenberg up and invited him uh, to New York to meet him. And so I was living in New York at the time. I think I was doing Saturday Night Live. And so we all met together. And then Marty was making this film uh, after hours. And I had a studio in the Brill Building, 49th and Broadway. And I was writing there. It was a, a completely soundproof room, no windows. I'd go in there in the morning. And I had kind of an electronic lab in there. It was in 19... It was in early early 80s. It was like after Saturday Night Live, and I was just had like a lab uh, using the Synclavier, which was this beautiful new digital computer. So I've always been interested in electronic music, even as a child, and I had tape recorders, and I would edit and overdub and collect uh, recordings and things like that. So my interest has always been in music and in technology. And so the lab in the Brill Building, uh, Griffin Dunn, who was starring in this new m movie that uh, Marty had made called After Hours, he knew I was in the Brill Building. So he, entered, he brought me up to see Marty, and I started working on the film. And I, I wrote an all-electronic score. There's no microphones. And uh, we had a great collaboration, and on we went. That was just showing music and image. It's not a mix from the film. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with the music for The Aviator and with the work with Scorsese, I imagine he's quite hands-on, more so than others. Well, he loves music, and I think that was always a great connection between the two of us, because I also uh, have that feeling. So it's always innovative working with him. He's really open to ideas. He's very generous, and we've had great collaborations. I'm proud to be amongst his collaborators that he's had. It's Bernard Herrmann, Elmer Bernstein, uh, Peter Gabriel, you know, so Peter, uh, Phil Glass. So it's wonderful to, 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 when I'm working with him. And I love working with Thelma Schoonmacher. You learn a lot when you work with, with Marty because he's showing you other films and, uh, you know, it's a constant... Uh, Wor world of of creativity, really. You've mentioned Thelma a couple of times. Yeah. What's the importance of the composer's work with the editor? Well, it's good to have a good relationship with the editor because it's very important, particularly in the dubbing of the film, the final editing of the film. If you have a good editor, they'll they'll treat your work really well, especially if they really understand. It, the value of it. And so working closely with an editor, I think, is is really important. It can mean that, oh, the difference between having your work uh, treated well in the final dub. I mean, think about fi film music and film. It's, it's Film music is, is essentially a completely recorded art. And so what happens after you make the recordings is really in the hands of the editor and the director. So editor is really important. And uh, you're saying it's in their hands, but how many times, I've always wondered, do you have to watch a scene when you're putting music to it? 
Uh, well, sometimes it comes rather quickly. I mean, I, I use this technique of, I mentioned it earlier, of the compositional folder. So on some films, I've actually created the entire score away from the, what I call the scoring of the film. I know Dead Ringers was done that way, and uh, Naked Lunch, and certainly a lot of other films as well, where I've collected these ideas, and they're not, uh, they're based on the uh, screenplay, they might be based on the novel of which the screenplay is based. In the case of Crash, you had J.G. Ballard's uh, novel and of course he's a great writer and I've re read other books that he's written so what I'm doing is searching and researching uh, searching my creativity and researching and reading and developing ideas that I want to use in the film I never confront the film head-on until I've collected the my ideas you know, based on research and uh, a lot of napping involved as well. <laughs> because I'm trying to get into my subconscious. I'm trying to dream about, because films, when you think about them, you think about the dream-like nature of them. Even now, as we sit in this dark room, we, we have the light in front of us. So I'm trying to tap into that world of, say, the aviator in a really kind of emotional, subconscious way so that I can be comfortable writing about it and feel confident that my ideas are well expressed and they're founded in something that uh, is from my heart, you know, that I have a true expression. So I always go through that process away from the film and then I approach the film, becomes a much more detailed process. First I approach it compositionally in terms of harmony, counterpoint, rhythm, tempo, meter, all of those things are part of what I do when I'm actually putting this folder of music into the film. And uh, then I, you're making a whole different set of uh, uh, decisions based on how the scene's created, what the points of the scene are critical to meet, and, uh, and what's expected of the music in the scene based on collaboration with the director and, of course, with the editor as well. And then I go to the uh, uh, production stage, f finishing the orchestration. The orchestration is asking yourself, well, how do you realize the composition and the counterpoint and the harmony? How, who's going to play it? And what room is it being played in? And what are the resources and things like budget and instruments and uh, studios become more important at that stage. And then you move into the actual performance. The performance is uh, critical. It's, it's the conducting, you're on the podium, and this is the final performance. Some, uh, some recordings are done sometimes in one take. The lighting of the beacons I mentioned a few days ago uh, from the Rings films was done in one take. It was so dynamic, it was so wonderful, that's exactly what went into the film. So the performance is very interesting and creative. And then you go into producing, uh, which is mixing and editing, and it could be editing different takes together. And then you have to take that final piece and put it into the film. Uh, what happens when, sorry, <clears throat> when you've discussed the film, you've come up with music, and has it ever happened that when you've watched the image, the realization that the directors had is totally different to what you've imagined? Uh, it happens, yeah. And then you, uh, I, I remember there was a scene, I think in, uh, was it Fellowship of the Ring, the Council of Elrond. Do you know that scene? Mm -hmm. so, uh, where Fr uh, Frodo says, I will carry the ring. And then you see the glances <clears throat> of the of Gandalf and uh, Aragorn and Gimli, you see uh, th how proud they are that he's going to do that. And I wrote it once, and I recorded it, <clears throat> and it wasn't quite right. And Peter explained to me that this is a scene. Uh, he was trying to relate it to something that I might uh, understand the depth of the scene. He said, "This is a scene in World War Two." where the son is going off to war, and the father is proud of him, <clears throat> but very worried about him. 
And I thought, oh yes, I think I've seen that scene. I know that, I know that feeling. You're proud but fearful. And I rewrote the scene that night and just captured all the glances, all the gestures and recorded it the next day and that's what went into the film. So sometimes there's, there's trial and error. There's a bit of that, of course. You can't capture it all exactly right the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we're gonna show a clip from another Scorsese film, which is from Hugo, which is a Scorsese film based on uh, Brian Zelzik's novel. And uh, it's about a young boy played by Asa Butterfield whose father is widowed and then dies and he lives in a station looking after a clock and the clock master disappears but he's got this idea that within the clock holds the secret to him being able to communicate with his father. And of course he has to hide from the station master played by Sachin Baron Cohen. Incredible moment, incredible um, music. But in this film, Scorsese used digital cameras for the first time, having said he's only ever going to shoot on film. I'm wondering how the change in technology, you've mentioned it helps with communication, being able to compose from 9,000 miles away, but how has changing technology changed the way you score music? Right. Uh, I think with the, uh, with the cameras, this is the first film that Marty shot in 3D, and he was using uh, uh, a different technique than he had used before for shooting for film. This film is interesting because it, it won three Oscars for the visualization, for production design, uh, for CG, and, uh, and for cinematography. So it, it was in incredibly innovative at the time. The uh, technology that I've used over the years has really hasn't changed in terms of the uh, early process, the, the research. And uh, actually, the internet has made it a little easier for research because you can get, gather so much knowledge from it, uh, which is great. Uh, but I never had trouble before find, going to the libraries and. Uh, discovering all the books that I needed to find or music from music libraries. So I always used to do the research and then the technology uh, became more important to me once I started working with different filmmakers that were in different parts of the world and I could communicate. I could also do recordings now uh, from the studio in New York, uh, in Berlin or London. And we've done live recordings in Los Angeles and New Zealand. Uh, you know, over the internet. So that's made, if it makes, filmmaking, a lot of it is about good communication. So if you can have better communication by using the internet, then we use the technology. Uh, you've also gone the other way with The Fly. You've made, turned that into an opera. Uh, with Lord of the Rings, you've um, done live performances of it. Last night we did it with Crash. Right. What's that process like? And well, it's, th those are purely uh, music ideas. You know, the opera grew out of uh, my love for opera. I've been going to the Metropolitan Opera in New York for maybe 30 years studying opera. And uh, I used a lot of opera techniques, started to creep into my work in films, really from the very beginning, really from The Fly, which was 1986. And I always thought the story was a good opera story story, The Fly, like a tragic uh, opera. And so I did write it as an opera. It premiered at the uh, Chatelet Theatre in Paris, and then it went to uh, L.A. Opera. And I've written, of course, other compositions for uh, the concert stage, uh, concertos for piano, uh, cello, and uh, recently a guitar concerto for Milos. And... Uh, and other compositional ideas. I finished a Latin mass last year for a church in uh, Switzerland, the Hof Cathedral for Ludwig Vicky. And I'm, my interest is in music. So whether it's for film or whether it's a commission for the concert stage, if, it, if I'm interested in it, I'm, uh, you know, I like new challenges. Like the mass was interesting because I got to study a whole part of a religion 
that I was became interested in, and it was like opened up a whole new world to me, really, to be able to write that. Mm -hmm. uh, we're kind of running out of time, and I want to have the audience answer some questions. Sure. But I just got one more thing to sort of go over, which is we've mentioned your main collaborations, but you've also done films like Seven, Silence of the Lambs, Spotlight, big on <laughs> contrast. How does someone get Howard Shaw to compose? Oh, you forgot them? Mrs. Doubtfire. Mrs. Doubtfire, how could I forget? <laughs> right. Uh, I think it goes back to my beginnings, you know, repertory theater. It was drama one night, comedy the next. So I'm used to working with different subjects. And actually, I like the challenge. And so after, in 1986, I did After Hours, was released with The Fly and, uh, uh, and Big. Mm. You know, they all came out the same year. <laughs> And then, and so I was being offered a lot of different uh, films uh, from different, you know, was, people suddenly had a lot of interest in what I was doing. And so I would just try them, you know, oh, I could try that, or that's an interesting uh, type of orchestration I could do, or I wonder what it's like working on that. So um, I just came up to the challenge of doing it. If, if it seemed interesting, I, I tried it. And is there any special key to getting you to work with them? Is there, a, is there anything in particular that would grab your attention? Uh, I think the story w was really important to me would be the story and the, and the good collaboration. You know, I like to have dinner with the director, make sure that we're going to have a, a really good collaboration. I have a few people that I work with. I want to bring them in and make sure they're able to work with me uh, well, and you know that my work is appreciated and supportive, all very important to me, especially now, you know, as I'm working now. Of course, food always the key. <laughs> Can we get some lights up and some questions from the audience? Okay, well, this was very quick and in my eye line. If you can wait for the microphone to come. It's just coming from this direction. Uh, just over here on the second row. Uh, yeah. First of all, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Um, even more, your music for The Lord of the Rings inspired me to become a film composer, which is now working out, so thank you for that. <laughs> so. My question would be, since you're working on paper, um, how do you demo your work to the director, and then in particular case uh, of The Lord of the Rings? Right. Um, I, I, I didn't do demos. I used to do like a presentation of the piece, uh, in the, especially in the 90s. I would do, before the technology had really advanced that much. So they were uh, sessions. I'd write the score. I might have played it on piano, with sometimes with four hands, two hands to four hands, two people, sometimes just on an upright piano. Any way to communicate. A lot of the Cronenberg scores were just done in the studio, were created in the, you know, I'd write the score, go into the studio. Uh, David would sometimes be there, sometimes he wouldn't be there. But, and then in 2000, I started working with uh, mock-ups, because uh, I was writing a symphonic score. And they were very basic, and, but it was a way to communicate with Peter, who was 9,000 miles away. So, and since then, I've continued to do demos. Sometimes with Scorsese, I'll do it with two or three instruments, because uh, he doesn't use any temp in his scores for any reason. And so we would build the score step by step, I'd do these small recordings, they would go in the score, and then I'd build from there. Like The Departed is done that way. It started with one guitar, and then two, and three, and four, <laughs> keep adding to the composition. You know, they're kind of built over time. Uh, other scores, I've done uh, what I call demos, and then incorporated some of the electronics into the score itself. So it really varies on the project, you know, and the kind of communication you have with uh, filmmakers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Um, can we get a question in the gray at the back there? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. 
Hi, yes, uh, thank you for your work and being here. Um, I was always wondering, are there any movies you've uh, regretted not doing and or are there movies you would have liked to have scored but didn't? Yeah. Like, I don't any, really, like any title. Yeah, I don't really think that way. Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of other interests uh, than, than film, so I, I can't really give you g really good examples to that. Um, I'm happy for the opportunities that I've had and, and how I was able to work with different people. And I, I don't really go, go out of my, uh, uh, you know, world. I'm, I'm just happy for the work I've been able to do. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see. I'm trying to get a little gender balance here. <laughs> Over here, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> okay. Where are we? Hi, I would like to ask one question that uh, your relation to classical music, so I don't know that if you have some favorite composers who inspired you a lot, and uh, what is it? Right. Um, well, I discovered uh, Takemitsu's music, a uh, great Japanese composer, and then I discovered his, actually, his electronic music first. And I was really intrigued by that. And I was interested in uh, early uh, electronic pioneers of the 50s. And then I became interested in uh, Penderecki and uh, Cage. And while I was pursuing my interest in that, I was also listening to a lot of uh, jazz, which I became always interested because I loved improvisation. So uh, or, besides Ornette Coleman, uh, Charles Mingus, and uh, was very important to me. The uh, classical part of it just allowed another type of expression, a, a way to expand uh, my listening. So I'm a constant student of music. I'm constantly looking at scores, studying new works, uh, going to the opera regularly. I particularly love live performance, so I like to go to the concert hall and uh, hear new works. Great. Uh, we'll get this question here. Which one? Uh, just here, in the middle. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, it was mentioned uh, in the conversation, uh, Ed Wood, which is one of my all-time yes. favorite movies ever. Yes. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, the, the portrait is, is very honest. Uh, the, the Johnny Depp is not ridiculized, even as he is not as greatly talented as a filmmaker. How did you research for that? <laughs> and your movie really uh, does... Well, it, it catches the, the tone. How did you do that yeah. to, for I Ed Wood? It's a good question. I love this period in music. This is the late 50s. Uh, the time of uh, Afro-Cuban music was coming up into America. Uh, do you know the I Love Lucy show in America with the Desi Arnaz? And so I grew up in that period. Uh, Orson Welles' Touch of Evil. You know, that period was really interesting to me musically. Uh, and that's where the music of Ed Wood uh, develops from. Uh, the use of the, uh, the theremin in, in the score was also an instrument that came up in that same period. And uh, Lydia Kavina played all those theremin parts. She lives in Moscow. She lives in England now. And it was a way to bring together all those horror movies, Swamp Creature of the 50s, uh, Henry Mancini, who did a lot of those early scores from Universal in the late 50s, were in, in, you know, inspired me to write Ed Wood. And actually, he was going to do Ed Wood, Henry Mancini, as his last film. But fortunately, he, he got ill, and he wasn't able to do it. And he died a few months later, and I came in to do the film. I dedicated the film, my film music, to, to him. He's such a great artist. Uh, but it's just a period that I really loved. And, uh, you know, the period of the aviator and Hugo is right, that from the clips we saw, is right around a very inspiring period too because it's from silent film to sound. 
And there's just so much interest, innovation going on in both uh, film and music. So I, I like the historical nature of of the of writing for the for films. Even Middle Earth, which Tolkien created, which is five to six thousand years before our uh, culture, was of course interesting to create a world uh, that had that kind of antiquity and history to it. Fantastic to work with. Okay. Uh, I'm just trying to see if there's any women answering questions, but it doesn't seem to be. Okay, that question there. Yeah. Oh, I'll come to you afterwards. <laughs> well, oh, yeah, there? I was pointing there, but we'll... <laughs> Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'd like to know how do you usually decide about the tonality or the key of a, of a theme that you come up with, if it's an E flat, A flat. Yeah. And uh, my second question is, I'm sorry. Uh, Naughty, I think we'll just have that one question. It's related to the same question. <laughs> yeah. okay. uh, when you come up with the theme, how often do you usually transpose or uh, uh, modulate the same theme in the same movie? Right. Thank you. Right. Uh, key relationships are really of interest to me, and uh, every key I feel has a different resonance to it. And so I choose, I'm not sure how I actually choose them. I mean, I orchestrate a lot of scores myself, although I have worked with other orchestrators. But the choose are always the keys are always chosen uh, compositionally, and I'm not thinking uh, so much. Uh, you know, particular instruments, but I'm thinking of the range. And to me, orchestration is about range. But E is very different than E flat to me. And so, I don't know. I, I'm not sure how, it's like an emotional thing. And I, there's certain keys that I will just completely avoid uh, because of the range. And uh, working with film, you're not working in a pure sense. Actually, with the opera and the concertos, I feel more range in terms of key, uh, of what keys I, I, I want to use. And sometimes I use, just use all of them. But in film, I'm very, very conscious of uh, certain relationships, and it probably has to do with the dialogue, the, the, the sound of the film, the timbre of the sound effects, that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay, behind you. Thank you for your story. Um, I was wondering, uh, you said sometimes they tempt movies with your own music, uh, but if they don't, do you experience troubles with temp love and how do you deal with temp love? He's asking about directors who have love of the temp. Oh, well, I, it could have a better, you know, I mentioned. Uh, Peter Jackson and Fran Walsh on, on Fellowship of the Ring, that the temp that they use was why they called me. So I can't really say I completely dislike it because <laughs> it, it was a way that they communicated with me. Um, it can be restrictive, you know, as long as it's... Some people use it and then they... You know, like Cronenberg would never put temp in the score. He doesn't want to watch his film... Uh, Scorsese would never watch his film with anything except what he wants in the film. So he wouldn't put something from another film in his film and watch it. And a lot of other filmmakers uh, f feel the same way. Like they don't want, you know, it, it, Tent Music came out of the uh, test screening process where you cut the film, you hadn't scored it yet, but you wanted to show it to an audience. And so my advice was always just to use minimal amounts of music, just so you know you could tell the story without. But then it got carried, it got carried on a little bit too much, and it can disguise a lot of problems with the film, the temp. So I I would recommend if you're going to use it to either or you know I recommend don't use it at all, and work with the composer to maybe put some early music in. But if you're going to use it, use it extremely sparingly and don't rely on it for editing or for, you know, really making the film work rhythmically. 
Okay, I'm just going to let these last two questions, which is the lady there and the lady at the back. Thank you. Um, I'm a big fan of Lord of the Rings, and um, as much as I love the acting performances, it was really the music that brought me to tears a few times. Um, is there a particular track on one of the three soundtracks that had the same emotional impact on you? Uh, yes. I mean, in Fellowship of the Ring, the fall of Gandalf was very emotional. And uh, there, I wrote the piece, and then they, I asked uh, for... I was working with a, a Maori uh, Polynesian group for the Mines of Moria, 53 men. And I asked for a singer to sing that piece, The Fall of Gandalf, for uh, soprano, mezzo-soprano. And she was a woman living in the South Island in a very remote part of New Zealand. And she came up to Wellington, and she sang that and just broke my heart. It was so beautiful. And it's exactly what's in the film. It's like one or two takes, and that was it. OK, can we yeah. just get this question here? Hello, my name is Sonia Hermandos. I'm a documentary filmmaker. Yes. And my first film was shot by Ellen Kuras, uh, oh, yeah. American uh, yes. DP. And she also made a documentary that was scored by you. Yes. Um, and I, I always also score my documentaries with original compositions. Yeah. And I was wondering how many other documentaries you scored, and if you, if you see a difference between scoring a documentary or a fiction movie. Yeah, I, the the one I did with Ellen Curtis is called Near a Coon, the Betrayal. The betrayal. Yeah. It was a documentary. She spent 25 years making uh, the piece. It was about a family from Laos during the Vietnam War. Very powerful <clears throat> documentary. Um, I did one other one with Scorsese about uh, Armani. Not, not as emotional as the Curtis one. <laughs> uh, but I did do that one, and I can't think of Alan. I don't know if he's here. If there's another one I did, I can't think. It may have been just those two. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to just end by asking you about the future, but I want to also say, when we finish, please do not rush the stage because um, it will be nice to give Howard a little break. But he will, if you have anything to sign, if you go out the back, he will come and sign a couple of things at the end, so please let Howard off. Do not rush the stage, give him five minutes and he will come out and sign some things. Um, so just to end, what's next, Howard? Uh, there's three scores co coming out. Uh, one is a film, a score from a film with Francois Girard called The Song of Names. Uh, it's a beautiful film and I used a it's set during the Second World War, and I used the violin virtuoso Ray Chan. It was recorded with the Metropolitan Orchestra in Montreal. And then I just finished a film with uh, Michel Hazanavicius in French. It was uh, produced in Paris called The Lost Prince, and that's premiering uh, tomorrow in Paris, and then coming out in uh, fe February 12th in France beautiful uh, fantasy family film. And the guitar concerto called The Forest, uh, written for Milos, uh, is being produced this year, the recording, and uh, should be out in the fall. So those are three new scores coming. Howard, thank you so much for being thank so you. generous with your time. It'll be a great work. It was wonderful to see you. Thank you so much.